Ka tangi te titi, ka tangi te kaka, ka tangi hoki a hau. Ti hei mauri ora. E ako nui, e ako rahi, tēnā koutou katoa. E tū ana au, i raru te maru o maunga tapu, tū mai, tū mai. Ngā awa, e rere, e rere, e rere. Ka mihi ake ki a koutou, i ronga i te hawatanga o tēnei wā. Nō te tai tokerau tēnei, i ngari i tūpua ki au i motu eka, nō reira me mihi ki te honga kāinga, ngā iwe takitaki o te tau ihu, tēnā koutou. E te tī, e te tā, nau mai haere mai ki a whaiwhakaaro ngā takepū tāiao me ōna pā ngā katoa. E ngā mana, e ngā reo, rauranga tira mā, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to you all. Thanks for joining us this evening, and welcome to our inaugural Intelligent Guardians event, a live discussion on utilising science and technology to protect and prosper. We are streaming live from Suta Art Gallery in Whakatū, Nelson. We are broadcasting across social media and on nelsontasman.live as part of Tech Week NZ. So to those of you joining us online from around the country, Thank you for joining us this evening. We also welcome a selection of companies from around the country who we invited to join us this evening as we recognise the good and important work you all do and we wanted to say thank you. Tonight is an opportunity for you to sit back, relax and enjoy the conversation. We hope you enjoy the box of goodies we sent your way from Nelson Tasman this evening. For us here in Te Tauihu, tonight is an opportunity to celebrate and showcase some of the great work that is happening here and explore the full potential of the Intelligent Guardians concept. 2020 was an extraordinary year for the world, for New Zealand, and for our region, Te Tauihu. It was also an extraordinary year for the Nelson Regional Development Agency as it scaled up and responded quickly to become the backbone of our local economic recovery. Through Project Kōkiri, the response and recovery collaboration backed by local government, central government, mana whenua and the business community, the response collaboration delivered some extraordinary results for Nelson Tasman over the past 12 months, amongst them delivery of a one-on-one -on -one business continuity service for over 2,000 local businesses since lockdown, the delivery of the We've Got This Kaiatato campaign, which put Nelson on the map and reached over a million people on social media, coordination of a new skills and workforce development program that focused on supporting young people into employment pathways who were the most affected by COVID-19 and delivering targeted seasonal labour campaigns to entice workers to the region. It also included the provision of a regional projects pipeline which supported a coordinated regional bid for shovel-ready projects and supported the investment of public, the attraction of public investment from funds such as Jobs for Nature and the Strategic Tourism Assets Program. Most of that you probably know but what you may not know is that in addition to this, NRDA was also tasked with researching and progressing the region's proposition when it comes to attracting new businesses here to fuel our economic development. What we discovered is that while Nelson Tasman is no Silicon Valley and that there is a lot of room for improvement here in the development of our tech and innovation ecosystem, there is an interesting and exciting emerging opportunity as more and more of our local businesses step up and tackle some of the great challenges we are facing, particularly in the field of applying research, science and technology to solve those problems. This emerging opportunity, often referred to as our knowledge economy, is the basis for which we are gathered here this evening. As Project Corkity and the NRDA shifts its focus from the immediate economic recovery from COVID-19 to the regeneration plan for the region, we are excited by the possibility of building Te Tauihu Nelson Tasman as a destination for businesses that care and where our local entrepreneurial ecosystem becomes focused on playing to our strengths to solve some of the great problems we are facing. Intelligent Guardians is the idea coined by the NRDA to capture the growing cohort of businesses in this region who are working with science, research and technology to deliver more sustainable outcomes for business. Other cities have done similar things. Dunedin has a very successful tech startup scene. Wellington is widely known as the creative capital of New Zealand. And even further afield, places like Portland have built a reputation on being a place where green companies thrive. So tonight is both an exploration of that concept for Nelson Tasman and a celebration and showcase of some of the good work that is already happening here. It's a chance to hear from some of our local leaders in this space and for you to have the opportunity to have your say about the kind of future you'd like to see here in Te Tauihu. 
It's a continuation of the good work done under the Te Tauihu Intergenerational Strategy, Tu Puna Pono, or Being Good Ancestors. And it's a continuation of a conversation to seek to understand how we can be good ancestors and intelligent guardians in the 21st century. This intelligent guardians idea acknowledges that the way we've been doing business is the cause of many of the major challenges the world faces today. But it also acknowledges that doing better business is a large part of the answer as to how we can overcome these challenges and turn crisis into opportunity. The concept is simple. To protect is to prosper. We help companies that care to thrive. This is our future as intelligent guardians and good ancestors leading the world on regenerative solutions to our most pressing challenges. So tonight I'm really excited because you'll hear from some inspiring leaders who are charting the course of a regenerative economy for Te Tauihu already, leading by example in their businesses and communities, playing their part in the movement of people helping shape an exciting future for Nelson Tasman and Te Tauihu. Tonight is an opportunity to explore that common thread that unites them and so many of our local companies in their quest to deliver commerce that is more sustainable, inclusive and regenerative for the people and places we value so dearly. To be a part of the live discussion this evening, this is, we're asking you to jump online and we'll have more details on the screen shortly um, to slido.com and submit your questions to the speakers this evening. We'll put those questions and more to our panel after we've heard the first round of keynotes this evening. Tonight, you'll hear from the following speakers. Florence van Dijk, the co-founder of Chair Sisters and Businesses for Climate Action. Volker Kunsch, the chief executive of Cawthron Institute, New Zealand's largest independent science organisation who are celebrating their centenary in 2021. Mariana Stevens, the innovation director of Wakatu Incorporation and the leader of the business unit O Order and the Tetawihu Intergenerational Strategy. And Mark Houghton Brown, the founder of Nelson Artificial Intelligence Institute and a serial investor and entrepreneur here locally and abroad. At the conclusion of these keynotes, we will break for 15 minutes to give you an opportunity to recharge your glasses before we dive into the panel discussion to conclude the evening. Now, nearly two years ago, many of you here today sat in this room for our first Te Tauihu Talks to launch the conversation which led to that regional strategy, Tu Puna Puno, or Being Good Ancestors. So throughout the evening, we'll be playing snippets of those talks to refresh our memories. To keep the evening running at pace, these videos will play immediately prior to the speakers coming on stage, but I'll let the speakers introduce themselves, and they'll hand over to each other to keep the conversation flowing at pace this evening. As I said before, this is one evening we're actually asking you to take your phones out. Um, hopefully I don't have to tell you to put them on silent, but you are welcome to use them during the event. Uh, take photos, videos, use the hashtag Nelson Tasman and submit your questions. If you're in the audience with us here tonight, you need to visit slido.com and use the event tag IG2021, which will take you straight to our live Q&A feed for the panel. Uh, if you're joining us virtually on nelsontasman.live, then you should see your Q&A box presented on screen right now. But without further ado, I'd like to welcome our first keynote speaker for the evening, Florence van Dijk. But before we do that, a few words from Jan Hania. I think there's a, there's a slightly different view. In, you know, I'm an engineer by training, and, and basically engineers love constraints. Mm -hmm. Constraints provide you with more ability to innovate. Mm -hmm. And so you know, if we look at regulation, as particularly when we're facing these, these difficult threats, and yes, we need solutions which help design us and get a pathway to there. If we don't set some constraints now when the urgency is high, we won't innovate. We'll just keep doing what we've always done. So there is a balance between you know, soft constraints and, and enabling, but also constraints where we actually have to force some hard stops to create the environment in which we can innovate. Heidi Takamua Takamuri Kua Ifai. Tina Koto Katoa. Ko Fungamoa Timonga. Ko Mahitahi Te Awa. Ko Aurere Te Moana. Ko Florence Tokoingoa. Tēnā te mihi mahana ki a koutou. Tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou. Tēnā tato katoa. Kia ora. It is only once we identify the flaws in our own human nature that we'll be able to challenge them. I want to take you all back to Psych 101. Imagine you're sitting behind a computer and the lecturer tells you that you're working with the person next to you. Their name pops up on the screen, and the goal of the lecture is to catch fish. You're told that if you each catch one fish per day, the fish population will stay stable. If you choose to catch less than one fish a day, the fish population will increase, 
if you choose to catch more than one fish per day, the fish population will decrease until the fish species eventually becomes extinct. The question for each student is how many fish do you catch? The answer for most of us here will be one fish. We want to ensure that we have our own fish supply while also ensuring that there is enough for all. But what happens when you don't know that other person that you're working against? And what happens if it's not just one person, but 1,000? Or say, one billion? And what happens when those others start taking more than their fair share? Do you start catching less fish to ensure that the population stays stable? Or do you increase your fish catch too to ensure your own supply? This is a story we know all too well. It is a tragedy of the commons. Inevitably, if we're all left to our own devices to act in our own self-interest without rules and social structures and governance, we will, most of us, act contrary to the common good leading in the depletion of shared resources. Humans do innately want to care for one another. It's just that there's boundaries to this. We're more likely to feel a sense of responsibility for a small group rather than a larger group, for someone we know rather than someone we don't, or even a stranger in our own hometown compared to a stranger abroad. And most importantly for tonight's conversation, the boundaries around this are also temporal. We're more inclined to feel a sense of responsibility for someone today rather than that same person in the future. And if that person isn't even born yet, then our sense of responsibility for them, our value for them, decreases further. This is a flaw in our human psyche, and it is taught in Psych 101. And it is the reason we have such short-term mindset in our business thinking. It is so ingrained in our society that we even have ratios that have been created that discount the value of the future. And these are used by businesses and governments across the Western world. But humans do have the ability to think long-term. And some of humankind's greatest achievements have been achieved through long-term thinking. The uh, pyramids in Egypt, the public investment in Roosevelt's New Deal, and I think one of the very best examples, our own Tatoihu intergenerational strategy. It's time for us to start identifying the flaws in our human nature, these flaws that are taught in Psych 101 around who we feel responsible for and when we feel responsible for them. And it is only once we do that and challenge them that we will overcome business as usual to become good ancestors in this region. Which leads me to why I'm here this evening. I grew up here in Whakatū and with that came a deep respect for the whenua. For a living, my parents made and sold possum fur hats to save the Kaharangi forest. We spent weekends planting native trees in the park across from our house. And we even had a family holiday searching for the South Island Kōkāko. We would play the recorded Kōkāko call into the bush and wait for hours, one point even a whole day, hoping for a return call. And later at university, I helped write the founding documents for Generation Zero, a youth-led climate change advocacy group that now has a following of 50,000 and has been a key driver in recent climate change policy. And then I started a business. And with that came the sudden shock and the sudden realization that the traditional way that we are taught to do business, that is deeply ingrained, clashed with some of these personal values. Society has embedded that short-term mindset into our business decision-making. I watch myself create 12-month business plans and intently watch our annual, monthly, even weekly profit and loss, all the while knowing that it is businesses, businesses that are largely responsible for a huge amount of destruction that is happening on our planet, and that short-term thinking is the key driver behind this. 
So I knew I was stuck in this short-term psyche, and I knew we needed to get out of it. But I was struck by that paralysis, the overwhelm that we often get when a problem is too big. We don't know where to start to solve it. So we decided to start with what we could control. And our first opportunity came in 2018 when our contract manufacturers, the company that made uh, made all of our drinks for us, went into liquidation uh, at very short notice. In just four weeks, we went from being a seller of drinks to a maker of drinks. And with that came a whole bunch of challenges. But it also gave us the opportunity to start thinking more deeply about our business. We knew that with every business decision we made, we could think about the future. And so we used this huge disruption that our business was facing to start living and breathing our personal values at work as well and start thinking about the long-term impact that our business was having. Our first shift towards long-term thinking was to line our new factory with solar panels and become New Zealand's first solar-powered juicery. The panels in our factory can harness 16,000 watts of energy per hour, which is twice the amount needed to run our factory, so we can sell what we don't need back to the grid. The second shift towards long-term thinking was to hire fantastic staff and pay them well. Every single person at Chia Sisters, including everyone on the bottling line, is paid the living wage or higher. The living wage is a fantastic concept in New Zealand. It's 25% more than the minimum wage, and it's the amount needed not only to have the necessities of life, but to be an active citizen in our society. We do this because we know our team is our most important asset. And we know that when they have time and when they have financial security, they feel more connected to their whānau and to the whakatū community. Our third shift towards long-term thinking in our business happened when we started discussing climate change more deeply. We'd always been very interested in climate change, but we realised that we didn't know how much carbon our business was emitting where that carbon was coming from, and what impact that was having on our business in the long term. So we decided to do something about it. Firstly, we measured our carbon emissions through the local consultant, ECOS, and that gave us the data to understand the problem that we were trying to solve. Once we had that data, we went about reducing our carbon emissions as much as possible, we did that through insulating our bottling line, through shifting to an electric vehicle when we need a new one, and eliminating all air freight from our business. The third step was to offset our remaining emissions, uh, which we did by contributing to the Ramika Forest, which is a certified carbon sink over the hill in Golden Bay. And finally, we built this process into our business decision-making so that for every single decision going forward, we thought about the impact of that decision on our carbon. Our fourth shift towards long-term thinking in our business was to apply those values, the reasons that we've been through that zero-carbon process across our business as a whole. So we've created an ethical business framework through B Corp, which we finalised a couple of months ago. And it applies those same values, but not just to sustainability and not just to the environment, but to community governance and equality. And lastly, we have realised that we cannot tackle these issues alone. It is only collectively that we will be able to change business behaviour. We founded Businesses for Climate Action about 18 months ago with the goal to have 1,000 businesses measuring their uh, carbon emissions and also working together on climate solutions. By sharing knowledge and sharing data, we can come up with blueprints for best business practice and we can share those with our community, with Aotearoa and with the world. I think that... Businesses working together is not only critical right now to change business behaviour, but it is also going to be an integral part of the way we do business in the future. So to finish, we need to deeply consider 
the world that we want future generations to live in. And we need to work backwards to create that, just like we've done with the Totoihu intergenerational strategy. To become good ancestors, intergenerational justice needs to be on the table in every single decision that we make. And businesses are no longer exempt from this. We need to stop thinking short term. We need to stop applying ratios that discount the value of the future. And we need to start ingraining long-term thinking into the very core of our business decisions. The journey to get to the future that we want is going to be a long one. And it's not just about improving business as usual. It's about rethinking the structures that businesses are operating within and recreating the foundations to be long-term focused. Kia ora. The beauty, I think, of businesses is that they have this ability to influence um, how their people behave, mm. um, the activities they undertake, um, the resources that they control. Um, if they are profitable, which hopefully they are, they, they have to be if they want to be there in the longer term, then they also have important decisions to make about how they use that profit. So um, I think business has a huge opportunity to really grapple with the, the issues that are, are right in front of us in terms of climate change, uh, how we treat people, uh, how we pay people, you know, all of the things that are within our control. Mm. Kia ora tato. My name is Volker Kunsch. I'm the chief executive at Cawthron and I feel extremely privileged to be here tonight, having joined Cawthron only in March this year, having moved down here with my family to Nelson into a very like-minded community, to be standing here, be regarded as an intelligent guardian, and to, to share my experience with you. Before I started with Cawthron, I spent over 30 years in the seafood industry. Originally, I'm from Namibia. I studied zoology, giraffe and bettiered foxes and ended up in the seafood industry and realized very quickly that applying science in a business environment makes a big difference. Not only do you convince people to work differently, but you also see that there's actually a positive outcome on the bottom line. And as I moved over five continents and embarked on jobs, eventually being the CEO of different companies around the globe, always in mind with, with that thought in mind that we'll make sure we only catch that one fish, um, making sure that our whole approach is sustainable, I realized that there was always a conflict between my values and where the company actually wanted to head. So you can imagine how privileged I feel and I felt when Cawthorn approached me to um, offer me the job of the chief executive here. And I'm really proud now to be able to share some insights um, into Cawthorn with you. But let's start at the beginning. Thomas Cawthorn arrived in New Zealand as a 15-year-old with his family in 1849, and they settled in Nelson. His career was all around being a, an agent in shipping, supplying the gold fields in Australia, working um, for the Dun Mountain copper mine in business development, and he had amassed a large fortune already at the age of 30. At the age of 50, he retired and then became more and more involved with um, civic affairs here in Nelson. And he traveled to England during his retirement and realized what big um, impact science can have on economic development. And that made him um, develop a will that um, we are now the beneficiaries of. He left um, a large part of his fortune behind to build a science and um, technology institute and school um, in Nelson which is now the Cawthorn Institute, and we started, as was mentioned earlier, a hundred years ago with our institute. Very much around, we need to make science happen in New Zealand. So a hundred years ago, that, um, that happened. His focus was very much on the Te Tau Ihu um, region, and I'm very proud to now be the CEO of a company or of an institute that has 300 people from 35 nations, 50-50 male-female, about half of us are 35 or younger, um, 65, 
65 have a PhD. Um, so you can imagine what an inspiring group of people that is um, to try and, and, and run. Obviously, the elephant in the room at the moment is he's going to turn us into a business. But um, the idea is really to somehow apply science out there in the real world. One of the big um, eye-openers that I've experienced is that most people, even in Nelson, don't actually know what Cawthron does, what the Institute stands for. And um, I would like to share more um, about our activities with the next slide. The purpose um, that guides our activities is all around um, world-class science for a better future. And if I say world-class science, then that actually applies. When I talk to people, our colleagues back at Cawthron, and ask them about the reason for being in Nelson, often the answer is because that particular scientist or that particular scientist works, works here. That's why I made it from the U.S. to come to Nelson. Um, so we have some really fantastic people. We publish about 150 papers um, per year in scientific journals. Very productive. Just a few photos. I'm sure that there are people in the audience that know more about Cawthron than I do, um, and I'm happy to pass questions on if it gets to the detail later. But um, this is really a cross-cut about what we do. We basically work in the marine environment, both oceans and freshwater. On the top, uh, bottom left, um, we are sampling the sediment of lakes around New Zealand, which is a major MB-funded project to understand the history of our lakes and see how population dynamics over time have impacted on the health of those lakes to also learn how we need to treat these lakes going forward to ensure healthy ecosystems. The muscle, muscles in the middle highlight what we do in terms of shellfish, building hatcheries on shore to ensure that we actually have a way of combating ocean acidification and reproducing these species and making sure we have a consistent supply of very valuable species. Um, the salmon, we are um, developing more resilient salmon to make sure that they withstand higher ocean temperatures in future. Down on the bottom here, an ocean boy that gathers data at sea in real time to uh, inform us about what the temperatures are, the, the turbidity of the water, and in future hopefully gives us information about biosecurity changes um, or even video footage from what's happening on the oceans since we've got a very big ocean space around us. And on the top left, everybody these days talks about Asperogopsis and the opportunity to utilize that red seaweed to reduce methane emissions from cattle. Um, we are working on that project as well. There's possibly great opportunity, and I'm very happy to share with you that we are opening our National Algae Research Center on Thursday. The Prime Minister is coming down to Nelson um, to do the honors. And, um, why are we so focused on um, these topics? I would like to um, give you one great reason why aquaculture is such an important part of our um, work. If you look at New Zealand, the land mass makes up 4% of our total territory. 96% of our territory is water or ocean. At the moment, we farm just a tiny bit of that water, the potential is 6%. The 6% relate to farmable water space using traditional methods, using um, pre predominantly protected areas, um, from, or sheltered areas, I should say. Imagine we were able to actually farm species further offshore. Imagine we were able to actually utilize so much more of this water space to reduce the impact that we do through agriculture on land. Um, we would be much better off, wouldn't we? That's what Cawthron is working on to a large degree, ensuring that we understand how we can tackle the oceans out there with technology that withstands the um, incredible dynamics of the oceans that um, can um, harvest species that can build us a new economy like seaweeds. And talking about seaweeds, our focus is increasingly on algae, microalgae and macroalgae. It is exciting to understand that some of um, our activities are around developing pharmaceuticals from microalgae. Invisible, basically, they lead to poisoning in shellfish, for example. 
to develop from those ergi a, um, an aesthetic that would um, possibly replace opioids in, um, in applications going forward up to um, working with seaweeds that can reduce methane emissions. There is amazing potential across the varied species that we have in New Zealand. Sorry. There we go. The um, work that we are about to, um, to introduce to you much greater um, to make sure that everyone understands what Cawthorn is really about um, ultimately will take place in the precinct that we've recently announced down at the port. This is an artist's impression, so I'm sure it's not going to look exactly like that going forward. But our laboratory um, on the top right there, the long brown building, that is where we want to bring all our expertise together with then a science and technology hub and offices around that. The idea is to bring a thousand knowledge workers together in Nelson in order to really collaborate and um, embark on the future in a very like-minded environment. Um, our challenge today is that many don't know yet what Cawthorn is about. We will make that much more tangible. As a management, we will come together next month to work on how we bring about um, a more tangible um, environment that people understand that it is really about blue carbon, green protein, and um, the climate resilience that, that we work on as a team of um, scientists. And um, I would hope that within this collaborative atmosphere, um, we will be joined by others here in, in Nelson as well. Um, our focus is very much on this region, but we would like to lead by example to bring about change in, in New Zealand as a whole. Why am I so passionate about this? At home, I've got a two-year-old, and I would very much like her to experience the world out there when she is my age, as I do today. And already now I know that that is probably quite unlikely, but with a sense of urgency that we are trying to create, for which we do need collaboration, um, and in this environment that is absolutely possible, I hope that we will be getting there very soon. Thank you. And so there's been a lot of talk in the regulatory space, particularly in councils who I work with a lot across the country, who are talking about soft landings, making sure that everyone feels comfortable about the transition to environmental sustainability. And I just don't believe that. Mm. And I don't believe it because I've lived it. Mm. And, and, and arguably, some of my whānau who were farming around Lake Taupo now make more money than they did before the cap. Because what that crunch does, what that stretch does, is require you to innovate. Mm. And funnily enough, we're all very agile, clever people. And we adjust in a way that we either make it or we don't. And those that don't make it, sorry, you weren't meant to farm anyway. Mm. And those who are, they adjust and create really great opportunities for themselves. And they see what's coming ahead of time. So soft landings for me are an excuse to not make brave decisions. Tuia ko rangi nui e tu nei, tuia ko papa tunoku e takoto nei. Ka nui te aroha ki te hunga ko a moe, moe mai rā. Ngā whānau hapu iwi o te tauihu tēnā koutou, ngā mana e tau nei tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Ko mā tātua me tainui oku waka, ko ngāti rangi, ngāti rangi nui, ngāti rārua oku iwi, Ki te taho tōku karaua, ko tuau whare papa, me poke ina i ngā maunga, ko motue ka te awa, ngā te rārua te iwi, turanga pike te tangata, te āwhina mara, te marae. Ko Mariana Stevens tōku ingoa, nō reira i te whānau, tēnā tātou katoa. So kia ora everyone, uh, my name is uh, Mariana and um, I do come from the best place in Aotearoa, New Zealand, uh, the metropolis um, of Motueka. I'm very fortunate uh, to be able to connect you um, and myself into this place, this place that I love and that I call home, our mountains, our river, uh, my marae and the people that I belong to. I'm an owner and director of Waka Tū Incorporation and also have an executive role, which is the general manager of O Order, which is a uh, nutrition, health and wellness solution business of Waka Tū. Now, I didn't end up being a director or a GM by accident, 
but I've come through our scholarship and our associate director program, which my family would say is succession, mentoring, and leadership by design. I often reflect um, about how we came um, to be here in Te Tawihu, the journey that my ancestors went on to come here through a series of epic migrations from the North Island over time. They were strong, they were courageous, and they were resilient people. They had to thrive in a place that was new to them, and they had to make decisions to ensure the future well-being of their uri, of their descendants. They were uncertain, and they were hard times. My ancestors were creative, they were astute and forward-thinking. They were the people who gifted us the land, our whakapapa, and our cultural identity. We benefit from their courageous actions today. And now we find ourselves living in uncertain times. This is not business as usual. And I ex expect that this period will be, will be reflected on in the future with much interest. What is our legacy? What will we be remembered for? Have we been good descendants? Have we been good tupunapuno, good ancestors? Wakatu Incorporation, we're a family business, a business of families. We have approximately 4,000 owners who don't all live in the metropolis of Motueka, but they do descend from the customary landowners of this area, Ngāti Kuata, Ngāti Rārua, Te Atiawa, and Ngāti Tama. When we started out in 1977, we had an asset base of a million dollars. And today we have grown that to over 350 million. And we are one of the largest private landowners and employers in the region. So that makes Waka 2 one of the most ambitious and exciting places to be part of and to work at at the same time. We have an incredibly dynamic team um, and business operating alongside a model of connectivity and accountability to our whanau, to our families. Our business means being present and accountable on the marae, here at home, right through to our customers and our consumers across the world. Being tupuna puno, being good ancestors, is more than a statement. It's a deep commitment and honouring of those who've been before us and for those who will inherit our decisions. To ensure alignment between our values and the way that we do business, at Waka 2, we have a 500-year intergenerational vision called the Pai Tafiti, which means to look out into the distant horizon. It recognises why that the, the world is changing all around us. There are constants, our values, our identity, our people and our community. And I often say in terms of the New Zealand business community, we're going from volume to value to values. Alongside our 500-year uh, uh, intergenerational vision, is our Whenua Order Program, which recognises our responsibility to manage our activities in a way that ensures the health and the well-being of our whenua, our land, our wai, our water, and also our tangata, our people. Whenua Order is all about the initiatives on the ground that make a difference. From our tika, from our lean program for efficiency of our resources, to the uh, development of our bird flight corridors, our zero waste and our zero carbon targets. Over our time, we will transition from conventional um, farming to tikanga led practices and actively con uh, continue to protect and restore the health of our water and our ecosystems. Meeting our core values of kaitiakitanga, guardianship and rangatiratanga, leadership, and taking ownership of how we respond will ensure our survival as intelligent guardians. And we think a lot about the intersection between modern science and mātauranga Māori, our traditional knowledge. And here is a photo of Wakatū and partners in Singapore at the Phillips Innovation Centre, exploring the most cutting-edge technology when it comes to health and um, the collection of, and use of data to enhance and save people's lives. Here is also a whānau, uh, photo of our whānau on the whenua, whenua growing indigenous crops, kumara, kamakamo, and potatoes. Learning and using traditional Māori practices and whanaungatanga, understanding our relationships with each other as kin and our relationship to the whenua, to the land, and the well-being of the taiao, our natural world. We must walk in both worlds, remembering our past to inform 
our future. So I, I always say that each of us has a story, we have a history, and something to contribute to this change. We all have the opportunity to be good ancestors and intelligent and guardians, as well as good descendants. And right now, the world is craving that kind of leadership, that long-term vision and action. Our future at Waka 2 is realising the potential of gaining more value from our natural resources in a way that enhances our natural world, te tayo, as well as our people, tangata ora. To achieve this, we are combining traditional knowledge, mātauranga, and science to deliver and design natural nutrition and wellness solutions here uh, in Aotearoa for um, the world. Aotearoa is the new business um, of Waka 2, where we co-design commercial applications from New Zealand-grown biomatter to support the health areas of obesity, diabetes, pain, skin, and joint health. We source uh, marine horticulture and indigenous organisms, which includes plants, fungi, bacteria, yeast, from our unique network here in Te Tauihu and across Aotearoa, New Zealand. Protection and use of our mātauranga and taonga is important to us, so we have quite an active programme in terms of supporting this. And our role is to ask the question, what are the health problems we are solving for our consumers and our customers, and how can we then apply science, technology and traditional knowledge to prove potential efficacy? We then co-design with our customers the final format, we work through regulatory requirements, and we take it to the market. Our first opportunity is kiwifruit powders that support some of us that may suffer from constipation, or perhaps we need to actually improve our gut health. And we are now launching um, our solutions into Japan. We also have quite a big pipeline when it comes to um, the marine space, and, and Balka uh, mentioned um, uh, seaweeds, but also we have native mussels, we have bacteria coming through the pipeline, so there's a lot um, happening. The other interesting aspect um, of our business model is that we do want to partner. Innovation doesn't need all to happen at Waka 2. We know that there is some fabulous and great um, innovation happening here in businesses, small and large, as well as in our research and learning institutes, and when they're in our families at Waka 2. About a couple of years ago, one of the Fano members, they did pitch um, boil up in a bag, said it needs a little bit more work. But, you know, it's, isn't it great that actually um, people are coming up with innovative ideas? So partnering, collaborating is very much in our practice and in our model. Many New Zealand businesses over the years have and continue to explore the concept of sustainability. We use the word and the Māori word that is being used, that is being used more and more in its place is kaitiakitanga, in an attempt to describe our unique place in the world and the love that we have for our place, our planet, and our products. This is our message and our core value proposition as Māori and as New Zealanders. However, there is a constant struggle by Māori to prevent the misuse and protection of Māori knowledge, language, and images. Māori have always been willing to share, and when sharing is genuine and mutually respectful, there is some pleasure in what it can achieve. However, however as a country, as businesses and communities, we continue to commercialise ourselves on the basis of Māori culture that is not based on true partnership, te triti. Then there really is no authenticity because it does not come from a place of whakapapa, of connection, love or reciprocity. If we are to be good ancestors, intelligent guardians, then transformative change doesn't mean tinkering with the existing systems or doing slightly more. It's the type of change that becomes sweeping. It often starts small, but it's strategic and it's enduring. As individuals, we need to use strategies, such as the Te Intergenerational Regional Strategy, as a blueprint to guide our decision-making across the region for the big issues that we are facing, if we are really to unlock all of the kinds of other change and set new standards for the way in which we consider the well-being of our natural world and our people in all our decision-making. And we must do so in a way that elevates and supports constitutional reform for our country and tino rangatiratanga. By looking to those who have come before us and thinking of those to come, we can see ourselves as part of a chain, giving us the strength and the motivation 
to navigate the way into our future. Each little action we take flows on to the next generation like a ripple effect, building on itself and becoming a legacy that can only be seen in retrospect. That is why Waka 2, uh, we convene the development of the regional strategy and why we are here today to talk about the potential of intelligent guardians and connecting all the good things that are happening here in the region to be able to realise the opportunity of an economy that places the well-being of our natural world to tile um, at the centre of our decision-making and our actions. COVID-19 has shown us what is possible when we work together, respond quickly to the challenges, look after our most vulnerable and prioritise our well-being. It's a salient example of why courageous leadership, prioritising well-being and acting with urgency can deliver the right outcomes for our economy as well. It's reaffirmed that we are resilient and we are adaptable people, that we can and we are, or that we can be world leaders on big issues. And we're facing some lofty challenges, climate change, inequality, biodiversity loss, loss of our culture and knowledge systems, productivity, poverty, and more. Within each of these areas is huge untapped potential for Tawihu to be able to lead on these big issues. The opportunities have never been greater, and we are a region of great talent with a history of innovation that we are seeing here tonight, and there are many more exemplars. So we are well placed to take on the big issues, and we must do this together. Unleashing the economic potential of this region in a way that supports better outcomes for our natural world and our people is lofty, but it's an entirely achievable goal. And I've been laying down the challenge uh, recently, which has not shifted from when we launched uh, the strategy, and that challenge was things will not change unless we change. We are armed now with greater resources and knowledge that many of our ancestors had. We are well informed and have the tools at our disposal to make the difference. Our collective apathy is our greatest threat. It's time to draw a line in the sand and commit to a bolder, more transformative and more prosperous path for our future. Are you ready? Because we certainly are. Nō reira e te whānau, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. The one thing I'm really passionate about is this idea of building an ecosystem where entrepreneurship and investment form two sides of um, a pōtaka, a spinning top, that need to be equally balanced in order to spin an equilibrium. And my ambition is for that ecosystem to pursue purpose as well as profit uh, and to do those things in equilibrium. In order to do that, I think we need um, to encourage an environment um, where impact is not a nice-to-have um, situation. It is something that is inherently born and integral to the business proposition that our entrepreneurs, who are world-class entrepreneurs, are trying to take to the world. And by doing so, by embedding that impact into the, uh, into the business, we can attract people who make investment decisions based on the same generation of impact. We can put our capital to use as a people uh, to create the future that we see for our children. Doing so, we can remove any reliance we have on external forces, on external institutions. And so when those groups do come into the fold, it's as equals and as partners, and we can both um, ascend together. Well done, Johnny. Awesome uh, speakers. Hard to follow. Thanks for putting it together, guys. Um, my name is Mark Houghton Brown. I'm here introducing Nelson Artificial Intelligence Institute. As for myself, I'm a bit of a jack of all trades and master of not very much. Um, I'm an organic farmer by profession, have been for 35 years now, an accountant by training, an entrepreneur by nature, and an environmentalist by conviction. Uh, professionally, these days, I'm mostly an investor and director who focuses my attention on screening and supporting activities which optimise progressive, impactful, dynamic change. 
So Nelson Artificial Intelligence was founded two years ago with the purpose of supporting the adoption of AI in New Zealand and specifically attracting more interesting, clever people to Nelson and applying possibly the most promising technology of the 21st century to solve some of the biggest environmental and social issues in front of us. My co-founders both have uh, PhDs in AI, and I, so I'm not the AI guy, just to get that out there. Don't ask me too many difficult questions about that. <clears throat> Julian McLaren lives just around the corner in Atafai. Uh, it's his 10th uh, wedding anniversary tonight, That's, and I'm standing in for him. Um, he works for Google on special projects. And uh, Brian Russell uh, lives down the other side of the road in Richmond, and he works for NASA uh, in wearable technology and sensors, something. Um, in 2019, I flew around the world six times for one of my portfolio companies, Biolumic, uh, which is a unicorn in the making uh, out of Palmerston North, uh, Massey University. Uh, we create light recipes to transform plant growth. So more parochially, we all want uh, and wanted to work close to home in future and create some jobs that our kids may one day be keen on if we're lucky. Uh, last year, we were joined by Alexei Rostopshov. I'm not sure if he's here tonight. Um, but uh, he's the head of uh, John Deere Labs and Sustainability, and he was on holiday here when uh, COVID uh, happened. So uh, we managed to persuade him to join us, and he's, he's still here, which is great. So what is AI? In our specific context, it manifests as state-of-the-art automation technology applied to digital information. We aren't creating new types of deep learning. Uh, we're not a research organization per se about AI, but we are largely using cutting-edge machine learning tools in different ways to infer useful conclusions. And we can and do create... Uh, unique intellectual property as we go, which can be patented. The data which we can use might come in any number of different formats, images, videos, sound recordings, text, in fact, any type of uh, signal at all. The territory where we can add most value is complicated and repetitive tasks, very complicated tasks. Often our models and algorithms, once properly trained, can exceed human accuracy um, and processing speed can be increased by several orders of magnitude. So this slide um, shows ChevNet. It's a 121-layer neural network. It inputs chest X-rays and outputs the probability of pneumonia with a heat map localizing the most indicative areas. And this slide shows microalgae. Uh, there's millions of species of microalgae. Most of them are harmless, but about six of them are highly toxic. And so accurate identification is critical for seafood safety and environmental monitoring. And our tool can count and identify the toxic ones in real time, near real time, very close to real time. <laughs> so we managed to persuade the Provincial Growth Fund to kindly lend us $3.4 million. And we've been applying for further grants and engaging in research projects. But our original thesis of joint ventures and consultancy in the aquaculture industry locally was not immediately realized for a variety of reasons, and COVID was one of those. Um, overall, it became evident that the business community wasn't quite ready to make the same leap of faith that we were in the timescale mandated. So we've pivoted to a, a different model, a, a venture studio model. We're probably the only one in New Zealand. And we employ an entrepreneur in residence to analyze problems and interrogate product market fit through a rigorous stage gate process until we're sufficiently confident of our thesis to form a spin-off company, which can then cannibalize our team, commercialize the opportunity, and raise capital for a new startup. I'm not sure the uh, Provincial Growth Fund fully appreciated uh, the dynamism of our pivot, but we are extremely grateful for their tolerance 
in supporting us, and it's already bearing fruit. So our first uh, spin-off is uh, called Carbon Crop. We formed the company on January the 1st this year, and we closed $1.85 million in early April from WNT Ventures, which is a Callahan incubator based in Tauranga at a pre-money value of $4.5 million. Uh, we've allocated 20% of the equity in carbon crop, just like we have in NAI AI, as an ESOP, an employee share ownership program, uh, which is a well-trodden, tax-efficient way of incentivizing key team members uh, with rewards and aligning everyone around good behavior and optimizing value creation. So I can tell you a little bit about carbon crop for a moment. Um, we're addressing the biggest problem in the world, um, climate change. Our broad hypothesis is that it's, it's bad uh, and money is going to be spent avoiding it. Uh, some people say it's the biggest business opportunity in the world for the next 20 years, but that might be a little bit cynical. Um, but we've definitely got to put a lot of money uh, behind it, solving it. Um, as a planet, we're on track to be 32 gigatons of carbon in the red by 2030. Um, against the Paris Agreement 1.5 degrees centigrade target. That's equivalent of half of total global emissions today. Deforestation is roughly five gigatons of that problem. Um, and forest restoration has the potential to reverse that and become five gigatons part of the solution. So that's a net change of, of 10 gigatons potentially. Carbon markets and forest credits are the lever that are going to make this happen. And that's going to mean a one gigaton carbon credit income stream worth 50 billion a year for landholders by 2030. Forest carbon credits are already a one billion a year global market and it's growing fast. The most proven and most scalable sequestration method. Our algorithms overlay over a dozen satellite images with mapping records and can automatically determine ETS, Emissions Trading Scheme, eligibility for any farmer and landholder. And it turns out that New Zealand is a great place to start because we've got a mature forest carbon market and only a very small amount of registered forest. Unfortunately, the methodology for registering forest is cumbersome, expensive, and labor-intensive. Consultants need to visit your farm, count and identify trees, sometimes cut them down, count the rings to find out how old they are. It costs thousands and it takes ages. We can turn it into a push-button operation, which can be done online, and democratize engagement with carbon markets for the first time. <clears throat> so that was exciting, wasn't it? Uh, what's next, I hear you ask? Uh, We've got around 30 AI-based ideas at the top of our funnel, including a predator platform uh, for identifying possums, stoats, and pretty much anything else that moves. Um, there's actually a cat down there in the bottom. Um, fish AI to automatically identify fish type and age. A dolphin alerter to let boats know when rare mammals are close by decision support to tools for regenerative agriculture. In short, we're confident that given some time and a bit of money, our engineers can solve difficult problems and automate complex decisions. So we want to work with local businesses and organizations on projects. We can undertake consultancy. We're open to ideas for collaboration on joint ventures. We're always looking for good people, uh, not just engineers, but also entrepreneurs. And we do have a vacancy at the moment. Uh, we can also cooperate on grant applications if that's appropriate. Thanks very much, Nelson, for listening. And carry on with the evening. We are in a crisis and we can no longer continue to operate in an economic model that uses natural resources as a tool instead of having a deeper relationship with those natural resources. You know, we, we need to be um, stewards and kaitiaki who are businesses.
not businesses who happen to be stewards. And there's a real difference between the two. Thank you to all of our speakers for those outstanding contributions. Uh, plenty of thought as we head into a quick break. Uh, before we do that, I'd like to remind everyone that the entire next session is based on your questions. So uh, you've heard four fantastic, inspiring stories of Te Tauihu businesses tonight and would like to put your questions to the panel. So if you'd like to head to slido.com and use the code IG2021, you can submit your questions, you can upvote other questions, and we'll tackle those straight after the break. Uh, right now we have an opportunity to recharge your glasses, grab a quick bite to eat and head back into the theatre. For those of you with us here this evening and not joining purely online, uh, we do need to vacate the theatre for a quick set change. Uh, there'll be some music playing outside when that music stops. If you could please make your way back into the theatre right away so we can get underway on time because we've got a great panel discussion to be had up next. Thank you, everyone. See you shortly. I'll know my hoki mai and welcome back uh, to our inaugural Intelligent Guardians event. Uh, thank you to everyone who joined us for the first half and thanks again to our uh, live audience online as well. Better kill the music. <laughs> um, we've got a number of people joining us uh, from outside the region tonight uh, on social media and on our own channel, nelsontasman.live, which we've set up in collaboration this week with Tech Week NZ. Um, so it's great to have other people joining from around the country. And we have dozens of questions coming through. Uh, if you are on nelsontasman.live or the Slido app, just a reminder, you can also upvote questions because we can already see from the list and the engagement tonight, we'll definitely not get through all of these. So if there's a particular question you'd like our panel to answer, the way to do that is to upvote it and we'll put it straight to them. Uh, I'm going to start with a soft one because there are some curly ones in there uh, for our panel as well tonight. Uh, this one is from Pip Jameson and just says, what should Te Tauihu be most proud of? Florence, maybe you'd like to kick off. I think to start with having that intergenerational strategy, which is thanks to Wakatu, and having public consultation of that that goes um, broader than a traditional community, like the community that might be here tonight, and that we've thought deeply about what we want our future to look like, and it feels like that strategy encompasses climate change, it encompasses biodiversity, children, all of these different spheres, and I think the task for us now is to use that strategy, work backwards, and start thinking about that on a, on a daily basis. Mm. Um Yeah, I agree, and uh, I also think, uh, and I absolutely love the people um, from, this, from this region. <laughs> I think that there is a real desire to be able to do things differently and to be able to you know, work together. So that gives me actually hope mm -hmm. that we can solve some of these challenges that we're facing together um, as communities. So yeah, I just love the people and of course I love this place as well. <coughs> Mark? That is a soft one, isn't it? Um, and, and all I can do is sort of extrapolate from what I've been given, but I think it's probably the sense of community um, and uh, uh, which is here. And also, there's a bit of momentum building. So, mm. Falky, you've just arrived. What, <laughs> yes. what are your impressions? <clears throat> and um, one of the reasons for living here is I always wanted to live in Nelson, um, the centre of New Zealand, a very collaborative atmosphere. Um, with a lot of aquaculture happening in this, in this part of the world. So ideally, we would lead by example, mm -hmm. um, make sure that the sense of urgency is actually understood here, and we, we go and put action to the visions and targets we have um, and, and make it happen, and ideally then get the momentum going for the rest of New Zealand. Well said. All right, we'll move straight on to another question then. So we've got one from Te Pōho, who actually you heard from earlier in one of our videos, uh, and who's known to members on the panel. You've got your whānau online here, obviously, Mariana, throwing in all the tough questions. Um, this one is, how do we use traditional knowledge to create beautiful, effective products that are, are authentically Aotearoa, but also protect that mātauranga on the world stage? And I've got a candidate to answer that tomorrow. Yes, that's, a, that's a very good question, and it's a... Um, question that we have been responding to um, at Wakatu and you know we often give the example the fact that uh, as a country we haven't protected our language so Manuka for example is a really good um, you know example of that and the fact that we're now burning cash um, trying to you know trying to protect that and there's only more coming uh, you know in the pipeline 
So um, it's not an industry problem. It's actually um, it's an issue for us as New Zealanders, especially if we care for those things that are inherently unique to us. And one of those things, of course, um, is our language. So we cannot wait for the Crown or the government to um, respond. Uh, Y262, which was the uh, Waitangi Tribunal claim around the protection of our taonga, um, especially around flora and fauna, uh, that was 30 years ago, no response. Mm -hmm. So one of the active things that we've done at Walker 2 is that we have decided actually we will not wait, but we will map all of those taonga species um, in our region. We will put it under our you know, custodianship. Mm -hmm. So that was really important. And the beautiful thing about that is is the fact that you know we've got over 2,000 um, species plants you know in that library, but also the fact we know what you can only find here in the region. We also know that there are I think 69 plants that have no names. Mm -hmm. So how wonderful is that for us as the whānau uh, and iwi here in as communities to be able to actually start to name mm -hmm. those plants. So therefore, getting our house in order uh, is is really important. And then it's around actually our relationship with those Taonga species. And then how can we then tell the world that story? And we've been to China. Uh, they have their traditional Chinese uh, medicine pharmacopoeia. It is protected and it is used to be able to solve their own health challenges. So again, you know, where is the Māori Pacifica pharmacopoeia? Mm -hmm. So te who can certainly take a lead around the protection and the use um, of those Taonga species. But it all comes back to values. Mm. Anything else to add? Well, yeah, I, ultimately, I think it's going to be central government, isn't it, who has to take the lead mm. in this, and also with trade agreements. Mm. I mean, if you look at the EU, that you know, you can't produce Stilton here, can you? Mm. That's protected, and that's New Zealand has to get its act together. So, actually, along those lines, which is thinking about, and, and a lot of the questions align in this direction as well. So, it's thinking about this regenerative economy for Te Tauihu, but how do we go faster? than policy settings allow us at the moment, and what will ultimately drive that change. Uh, it's also related to another question that came in earlier around how do we balance the urgency of some of the issues we're facing with the great stories we've heard tonight, but the time it will take to enact that change. Who would like to pick up on that? I think that by collaborating together, we can achieve so much more, and just even listening to some of these people, or all of you tonight, it's like there's so many different threads here in this region, and I think... We don't need to wait for central government if businesses are working together and sharing their knowledge openly in a collaborative way. We will achieve so much more faster. And I also, um, you know, probably uh, just to add to that, we're not very good as a region when it comes to advocacy and lobbying in terms of the priorities mm -hmm. and the investment that is required in this region. So I would like to think that um, as businesses and as Māori, um, you know, that we can, as Fossi said, you know, come together to be able to have this, you know, we've got the platform now with the strategy, and you look at those um, priorities that we have identified as communities, so let's get the plan of action in place and let's actually take our story, you know, take the, the vision to central government and say, actually, this is what we, we need to do, and then, therefore, um, this is your contribution towards that. Mm. I wonder whether there's not a step before to, um, actually going to government. There is such a collaborative spirit here. Um, the question alone indicates that there's that thinking out there. I think all it takes really is getting together and getting into action um, and maybe um, develop a, a working group that is really all about how do we make sure that businesses don't just start measuring their carbon emissions but actually devise new ways of um, working in a more circular manner instead of just creating a better linear economy as we've always had it, but to really take a different approach to what we do here. And I think that only works by actually sitting together and figuring out how that might work. We don't have that in New Zealand yet. There's one example in Australia, Bega Valley, where a cheese company has decided we are going to change the world in our valley. I think we are really um, in that great situation here in Nelson Tasman region to sit together and figure out how as a community we can actually do things differently and if I look at the fact that we actually collect our compost here, that that's mm. picked up um, haven't, haven't had that even in Auckland mm. um, there, there are, and that's just a little example of how things are done differently here um, I think we can <coughs> scale it up but we do somehow need a group that just takes the initiative and, and leads the way and maybe that is through the city council
Mm. Well, I think I think I'm hearing Volker lead one of the priority actions in the actual <laughs> regional strategy. So thank you, Volker. You're going to be busy, Volker. Uh, I think community compost is one of Nelson's best kept secrets, by the way. <laughs> I think it's a fantastic initiative. You know, Mark, I think uh, you, you mentioned in your talk. I think you described it as other businesses weren't willing to take the same leap of faith mm. that you were. So that's a recognition of some kind of complacency in the region or a maturity around this space. What's your view on that? How do we how do we get the action? How do we change that? If if I was to repeat the the most um, cited critique of the region, it would be that word complacency. I mm. think, and <clears throat> far be it from me to uh, you know dig into that here. But uh, you know the fact that it is such a great place to live, sunshine is so great, the beach is just there, the community is so wonderful. Yeah, I, th I think we've got it good. You know, we've never had it so good. And so it is up to those, uh, you know, who care to show leadership. And, you know, I, was, I, was used to, I used to start off my talks with JFDI, mm. you know, which is just a perversion of, the, of Nike. Mm. And we do just have to do it. Mm. I think probably just to, um, you know, just to add to that comment is the fact that sometimes you don't know how to make change. Yeah. You know, when I think about the farmers, the growers, the foresters, you know, with the plethora of policy and reform that's coming out, it's actually quite daunting mm -hmm. and it's quite scary. So we do need those leaders and those people to come forward and actually, and we don't have all the answers, mm. but actually we do have the solutions in our communities. <coughs> So I, I think it's a, you know, it's a bit of that as well. And I think it's okay not to get it right first time. I think we just need to be encouraging our businesses to give it a go and be innovative, be collaborative, and try new things. And some of them will work and some of them won't, and that's okay. Mm. Right, you're all agreeing with each other too much. So uh, we've got one here for Volker. The fishing sector is under pressure from the public due to unsustainable practices like bottom trawling. This is very topical at the moment. Um, Putting it to you, Volker, um, given your experience in the space, what what is the future that you see for for wild fisheries and, and the wider sector, I guess, as well? <laughs> <laughs> oh, gee, that's why I, <coughs> that's why I joined the Science Institute um, to get away from questions like that. Um, <laughs> I do believe that. Um, well, I should go one step back. I came to New Zealand because we actually have a really well managed fishery here. Um, with all the criticism that is out there on a global scale, this fishery does well. Um, the criticisms around bottom trawling, um, we worked on this topic a long time within the companies I worked for before. It is a very, very small footprint that is actually bottom trawled compared to the 45% in New Zealand's case that is actually ploughed on land. Um, at sea, it's something like 8% maybe maximum, but per annum possibly 1%. So those numbers are very, very small. There is an impact, though. We don't really understand the impact. Scientific studies show that um, that water, that substrate regenerates much quicker than it does on land. But with all that um, left besides, what do consumers think one day of us bottom trawling out there? And I think that's where the crux lies, that whatever we prove, um, the issue is that um, consumers might think differently, and they are the ones that um, buy our product. So I would go about it in a very differentiated manner, um, possibly develop ways um, that enable us to, to lift um, the nets off the bottom, etc. I do think, though, in general terms, if we talk about animal protein versus plant-based, there will be a definite shift towards plant-based, which is more sustainable. So I think the fishing industry will actually remain in place longer than um, any, any animal farming on land. This is no longer term. Um, but I think eventually, with the next generation coming in and putting a lot of pressure on sustainable protein production, um, the future is probably more f with um, seaweeds. Mm. Mariana, I want to come to you on this because uh, we're thinking about the agricultural food and fibre sector here in Aotearoa. Um, a, a more of a hero of our economy than ever before after COVID-19. Uh, you're active in this space, so we recognise that our largest export earner at the moment uh, does have a huge environmental footprint in this country uh, and has some major social licence challenges. So give us more insights around that. You've been on the primary sector council, you're active in this space. What do you see as the future for that sector? Yeah, um, that's, that's, a, that's a really good um, question. And first of all, I just I want to acknowledge actually there is a lot of work that's already you know um, already occurring in this space, 
in terms of thinking about the well-being of our natural world and also the well-being of the people because they are interconnected. Mm. Um, and so, you know, the, the sector is really wanting um, to come together better to be able to improve our performance. They actually do want to be good stewards. They do want to be good ancestors. And again, it's just that point around that plethora of reform that is coming out of um, central government. And to be by yourself to try and solve those problems um, is, is not an easy one. So I think there are some big conversations that the sector um, has to have. And then I think start to think about our banking infrastructure, our R&D system. Um, you know, is that fit for purpose in terms of where we need to go? But fundamentally, um, the conversations that we're having um, with the sector is really comes back to values, and it comes back to their relationship um, with the whenua and, and with the why. So um, I feel actually, again, in good stead, the fact that you know, if we can come together as a sector and we do have all the, the players together to be able to think about um, a new future together and what are those principles and that values that we need to hold as, you know, as, as the sector... And then how do we make the change, assess our current state, look at the, um, the future ambition, and then be able to design uh, back from that? And, you know, and what are those wellbeing measures mm. that we want to be able to have in place um, to be able to make the change? Now, the transition to, is not going to happen overnight, um, but I think if we can show the world that we're on a journey, we only want to be aligned with those customers that are the, the whenua order or the tire mm. order, customers and consumers. We don't have to feed the world. Um, and I think I'm hoping that we may see a reset actually when the future export for us is the way that we have transformed this country and the fact our knowledge systems will be valued, um, whether that's through traditional knowledge, whether that's through um, tech and science, and actually we are able to take that, those learnings and that knowledge um, to the world as opposed to probably the volume um, and you know that we're t um, currently taking, but that's not going to happen overnight. Mm. So it, it does need to be a reset. Mm. Let's focus on the region for a minute now. There are some, there are some big picture issues. Um, we, we have a question here that I, I typically would go, well, maybe we avoid this, but it actually came from a <laughs> councillor himself. So let's go there. Uh, what can the region's three councils do to help with this? <laughs> councillor Matt Laurie asked us, what can the region's three councils do to help? Would amalgama amalgamation of NCC and TDC make a difference? Uh, how about NCC, TDC and MDC? So a question around regional leadership. Who would like to kick off? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, amalgamation is probably a little part to solving the problem, if I'm honest. It actually comes fundamentally down to, actually, what is the future regional leadership model look like for us as communities. So I would like us actually to use that as a starting point because the systems and models that we currently have in place aren't working. There's a lot of duplication and waste. So I would like to think, and this came strongly out of the regional strategy, is let's start to have the conversation. Let's actually start to design you know, yeah. what we want as citizens in this region when it comes to regional leadership. I think yep. it's exactly the same as it's looking at what we want the future to be and then building backwards. And if that's amalgamation, then great. Or if it's a different model, then that's fine too. But we need to um, look at the future first. Mm. Coherent leadership is a pretty good idea, isn't it? <laughs> it's a great idea. <laughs> so, th I mean, thinking about that, one, one of the contexts that we're very aware of uh, as we progress into this new chapter of economic development and, and look at the regeneration plan uh, for, for Nelson Tasman off the back of the last um, very challenging 12 months, uh, we're thinking about the pipeline of reform coming down. And Midiana, you referenced it before as well, and, and local government has now been signalled as part of that. Uh, it raises an interesting question about us as Te Ihu and, and Nelson Tasman, and there's a question that's come through here saying, you know, do we compete or collaborate with other regions in New Zealand? What's our position there? What does it matter? Mm. Really, you've got to look at yourself and just do the best for this mm. region. It's not about other regions, is it? Mm. And th I think that it, it, is, it sinks in from the last question, doesn't it? If, we, if we've got coherent leadership and a, an actual collaborative strategy, mm. mechanisms in place to work together, we're not competing with anyone. Mm. And I don't think any one region can win out of yeah. this. You know, if, if we are leaders, let's bring others along with us, and that's going to be the best for Aotearoa and our region. Mm. Having lived in outside New Zealand for most of my life, 
um, and always having felt that down in New Zealand, the world is in order. It's a pretty intelligent um, population down there. They're very innovative. They have it all going for them. And to then arrive here and hear questions around, mm. shall we collaborate or compete? I think there's only one solution, and that is about collaboration mm. to tackle those big challenges we are facing. Yeah. Mm. And I'll just give an um, example, which uh, the last uh, week, you know, when I think about um, where our ancestors came from in, in terms of the North Island, and then obviously going through COVID and thinking about, you know, things like food security, you know, we thought actually about where our tupuna, where our ancestors were, and actually if we could rebuild, and that's just one simple thing, right? And so if you were to mm. think about where seed banks or nurseries and things needed to be to be able to ensure our survival as communities and be resilient, that's where I think actually we can start to be strategic about the other regions and how we share and how we collaborate um, and things that, you know, where there's alignment. Mm. So that's just a little simple um, example, but it's something that we're obviously, uh, you know, thinking about and get, getting back to different ways of trading. Mm. And so let's pick up on one of the biggest opportunities before us, which Mr. Valka introduced earlier in his presentation. We've had the announcement of the vision to develop the science and technology precinct uh, with, a, with Cawthron and Port Nelson. We've also uh, had the uh, announcement from Nelson City Council around the uh, Almantuma Library redevelopment, and we have Wakatu Incorporation uh, as well uh, building that riverside precinct for the city. So thinking about those opportunities that we have right now, uh, what are the things you think are important to consider in re realising the full potential of that precinct? <coughs> Probably start with you, Volker. Well, starting from um, <coughs> the due diligence, really, of the site, making sure that that's um, resilient and extremely sustainable to lead with an environment that, that again, sets an example, ideally made from timber, etc., to highlight this is what we're all about, to then making sure that we bring the right businesses together that bring about change, that bring about um, solutions to the big questions we have. That is, that's really the intention, making a difference out there. And to not only engage our region here, but to ideally bring capacity from all over the world here to, to make a difference. And that sounds very lofty, but if I, and I mentioned the number earlier, if I look at the fact that the 300 colleagues that I have at Corson come from 35 different countries and are all extremely well educated, um, I don't think that that's a big challenge, but we have to create an environment here that is um, hospitable, which Nelsonians are really good at, um, and that is um, really ambitious about making a difference. And I think the ambition, the sense of urgency, that is important that we put that forward. Mm. Um, and just on the, um, the Walker 2 uh, precinct, I mean, it was always our... Um, we have a close connection to the Awa, to the river, and I think um, to be able to live beside the river... <laughs> to be able to work alongside the river is, is really quite important to us. And so to have a place um, that can tell a story that you are able to connect in with, you know, and obviously we've got some ambitions around having potentially you know, a climate change you know, centre there is one of the op you know, opportunities. You know, and to make it livable, to be able to, uh, where people can come in and to connect, they can see all of the wonderful um, projects, whether you know, through R&D. You know, I think that, that's really quite important. And it tells a story. And so how do we get people to be able to connect into the different spaces that we have um, the opportunity to be able to redesign and reimagine? Mm -hmm. So for us, it is um, you know, really uh, exciting. And I think um, you know, it would be fantastic if we did have a 100-year plan you know, for our cities mm -hmm. and for our towns. In, ten, in terms, in, Instead, we've got a bit of an ad hoc nature in terms of how we, how we do that. So, again, it you know, comes back to the leadership, it comes back to the design of those places, and I would like to actually see our community more involved, because when you have their involvement, they connect in better, they come, and actually, I think a lot about the young people too, you know, where are the spaces for them? Mm. Mm -hmm. And, and on that note, you know, we, t we talk about a thousand knowledge workers along that Riverside precinct. We've got these enormous opportunities for the region to realise. Uh, Volker, you talked about the workforce within Cawthron. Presumably these 1,000 knowledge workers are not all going to come from the region, uh, but a good chunk of them, let's hope, will. So there's a question that's risen very quickly to the top here, which is how do we ensure we are creating and preparing the skilled workforce and embedding the training required to achieve these aspirations? And that's wider than the precinct, so anyone on the panel can pick that up. Well, we, we do have a programme with NMIT, mm -hmm. and I, I think it is up to local uh, education providers to... Uh, 
make sure that the kids of today are ready for that and they've got the skills. I mean, I, I also wonder if there's enough joined up thinking out there to mm -hmm. uh, make sh sure where everyone's going to live. Mm -hmm. A thousand knowledge workers, I hope they all don't live out mm. on the good agricultural land in the plains. Mm. Mm. So are, are we, have we actually got joined up thinking or are we just making it up as we go along? I think it's incredibly exciting, by the way, you know, developing mm. this Probably, um, yeah, I mean, that, that's a, you know, we are thinking about the uh, the future of workforce, and um, I mean, I've seen the latest stats coming out of, I think we need um, quite a lot of um, people working in that whole tech space. We're mm. short. You look at the NCA uh, levels, um, our kids aren't achieving that. The education system is, um, you know, is it, it's not fit for purpose, and that came out strongly through the regional strategy. Mm. Um, so I think there's a lot to be done. I mean, we often get questions, oh, have you got a Māori PhD or, you know, candidate? I just say, I'll go and pick them off the tree outside. There's none. <laughs> there's hardly any, right? And so we have to then start to think about, well, actually, it has to go back further than that. Yeah. Um, and so, therefore, I think our, school, our schools play a really um, big part of that. Of course, our relationship with the local um, institute and the other thing, um, we run a virtual network uh, at Waka too, so not all of the talent has to live here in the region, and given that we have got challenges around housing. So for us, if they're in New York, if they're in Tokyo, uh, you know, perhaps they're in Murupara, if the internet is good and we've got good connections, we can actually do business together that doesn't prevent us from doing business. Mm. So I guess that's something we've learnt, um, and especially more through COVID. But, yeah, fundamentally, um, the, the, the workforce coming through, it is Māori, it is Pacific Island, they've got the worst stats, and so there is a real need for us to do better uh, in our education system. Mm -hmm. well we, through our trust board, provide scholarships for students to join us. Um, we do open days in order to create more excitement about science. We interact with schools and NMIT, but you can never do enough. I mean, ideally, you want every young person to somehow be connected to science at a very young age and, and grow from there into a future scientist. Um, so if there are more ideas about how that can happen, we are very open to that. But, um, I think that's extremely important to build that local capacity. Mm. There's a, a, a question there. I mean, you mentioned it, Mariana, around the future demographics uh, of the region and of our country. Uh, there's a question here from Dara saying, how do we bring through the voices of young people in decision-making? Yeah, um, I mean, I think we, we're through the intergenerational strategy. We were kindly minded that we're actually still alive and uh, we actually have degrees and shit and this stuff uh, in terms of some of the problem solving. Uh, I think that was one of the sort of or some of the quotes that were um, coming through. And, and just actually last week when we were in Taranaki in New Plymouth, we had uh, the taiohi, the young pr uh, people present so that we could actually hear their voice. Now, what was encouraging about those young people is that the fact that they really celebrated and were thankful for the leadership and the work that our generation um, has, has been part of. So that was good. What they wanted, though, was probably a more um, inclusive way in terms of, you know, this gap between the have and the have-nots is not going away and it is concerning them. So how do you make the decision-making, the leadership, um, you know, more inclusive? But they just don't want the one person, you know, one of their representatives to be on there. Mm. They do want a different way in terms of, um, you know, how we are in engaging with them. And what I, you know, it was, they were very earnest. Um, I think a lot in our circles, you know, we talk about ma by Māori, for Māori, what they were saying, and they're all Māori there, actually, um, by New Zealanders, for New Zealanders. Yeah. So I think they're a lot more open, and, and we're probably seeing that from some of the learnings that are, that are coming through. And their their real honest way and approach of actually saying Māori, Pākehā, as New Zealanders, you know, we can work together. So I think it's you know up to us. I've probably gone slightly off topic here. Well, quite on topic actually, because we've got a question in relation to this. <laughs> our elected representatives seem to be highly engaged in this evening's conversation. This one's from our, our local Nelson MP, Rachel Boyack. Uh, and it's for you, Mariana. So it says, I'm keen to hear more from you about the future of New Zealand's constitution and the role of Te Tiriti. You mentioned this in your presentation. So uh, quite a good segue, actually. 
Okay, right. I think oh, that's a good question. Oh, we could probably uh, start with the Nelson Tent Sale Walk or Two case mm. first. But um, I'll probably lead in um, with a story, actually. And it's the story of when our ancestors, when they, you know, they were on Kaiteri Tere uh, Beach, and they saw those first ships coming in with those settlers, and they stood on that beach, and they thought, wow, here they, you know, here comes um, a new lot of people, and here comes the people that we want to um, have a relationship with, and that we will love them and we will care for them. And I think when, you know, when I think about this country and the opportunity, because for us, and in terms of our generation, that hasn't changed. But it's the fact that we haven't had those honest conversations in terms of what does genuine partnership look like? Because when there's a power imbalance, and when we have systems and models that are not solving the problems that we are facing as communities, then why aren't we prepared to try something different and new? And so that, for me, is something that, you know, when we went through the intergenerational regional strategy and the fact that that kept coming up time and time again, mm -hmm. you know, what is the new trust model? You know, what is it, the new leadership model? What is we as communities, can we have that honest conversation about the treaty? Can we then see the different ways and mechanisms that we, we're all benef where we can all benefit and there is no gaps between the have and the have-nots? But again, that's going to come back to us. So I'm not prepared to leave that up to central government um, to tell us what that looks like. <laughs> that is up to us to start to design the future for our mokopuna. So that's my response. Mm. Excellent. Someone pick up on that? Well, Johnny, surely every, every company can, can do it. I mean, we, yeah. we've got in Carbon Crop, we've got a, a shadow director program. Young directors come on, on the boards that are not in decision-making capacity, but they can, you know, they come along, they observe what's going on, and they get to understand the tough choices which you've got to make right, when you are making decisions. And so every company which is represented here can do that. Yeah. Great point. Um, changing gears back down now, thinking about small businesses. This one's um, for you, Florence. It says, you're a small business, and our economy, economy is predominantly made up of businesses that are small to medium. Um, how do we, the types of changes we're talking about tonight, uh, how do we support those businesses, small to medium enterprises who don't have the same capability and capacity as some of our larger organisations, how do we support them to make the changes required? Mm, that's a good question. Um, I think firstly for those small businesses, just knowing that it's not as hard as it first seems. So I'll use the example of measuring your carbon emissions. You know, climate change seems like this really scary, huge thing, and it's going to be um, impossible to make a start on it. But it's actually just breaking it down into those parts that I was talking about. So measuring your carbon emissions through ECOS. You know, it just takes a call to your electricity company, a call to your waste provider. And for small businesses, that's actually really, really easy. You know, you could make those calls in a day and have your carbon emissions measured, you know, for $500 perhaps um, within a couple of months. And I think just having the energy to get started on that process. And then I also think for small businesses, understanding... Um, the business opportunity there. Like, it's obviously the right thing to do for the planet, but also there are so many jobs in the space, and I think that consumers more and more are looking to support um, sustainable businesses mm. and businesses with this real leadership and deep values, um, and also that employees are looking to work for those businesses. So if you want to have good employees, and we all know that um, you know, we're only as good as our people, then it's worth making steps in that direction. So uh, that's not necessarily how to help small businesses, but I think that um, it should be clear to any small business that that's the direction that they need to take. Mm. I'll probably just um, add to that, that I think some of the bigger businesses also probably need to step up. Um, you know, I mentioned before, um, you know, Walker 2, not all the innovation happens you know, with us. Um, we've got a, got quite a traditional um, you know, business model, and so we like to partner. Mm -hmm. So when you're thinking about um, the global opportunity and the fact that, um, you know, I always say to smaller businesses, you know, are, are you prepared to spend 12 months on market? Because that's what it takes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can't, um, when you, you start talking <coughs> with our customers, they say, oh, we see you New Zealanders, you come up every six months and we don't hear from you. Yeah. And because it's difficult, right? Because you're having to run a business, you've got a family and all of those things. So again, you know, from a regional perspective, could we have shared resources 
when it came to things like the marketing and sales around the digital and all of those things to actually take our products uh, solutions you know to the world so again that came through strongly in the strategy when you start to think about provenance appellations all of those things around identity so I think as a business community there is the real opportunity um, for us to work across the value chain and in market mm. and there's so many overlaps like food and beverage we've got the producers here you know we've got amazing mm. chefs that can showcase the products, um, we've got also manufacturers and there's so much sense in overlaying um, that work rather than doubling up and taking that to the world. And all our marketers are sitting in those schools because they've all got bloody cell phones, right? <laughs> so if we were able to give the content, you know, imagine that. So yeah, I always have a bit of a laugh about that and I think they're all sitting in those bloody school rooms. <laughs> We've got an interesting idea emerging here as well that um, segues nicely from the work of the Tetohu intergenerational strategy, but this one is, is specifically for you, Mark. So what role could AI play in forming a real-time wellbeing dashboard, social, cultural, economic and environmental for the region, uh, mapping responses to intervention faster? Mm -hmm. Another Frank, project for you? Thank you, yes. <laughs> <clears throat> I, I mean... Um, Look, I really take my hat off to small business people because I think it's incredibly uh, difficult to do. And, and I'm, so I'm just going to you know, say I am one at the moment. And who's paying? Uh, yeah, but of course we could do that. Yeah, no problem at all. It mm. wouldn't be that hard. And if we want to, uh, for example, be, uh, have some real aspirations, the kind of aspirations Mariana's talking about, being a blue zone, you know, ha having uh, uh, longevity, quality of life as our goals... Mm got to measure them, right? Mm. Mm. Volker, you and I had a conversation about this recently. Uh, we talked about the Intelligent Guardians concept and, and the place where you took the conversation was how do we measure that impact? So thinking about that question and the types of work we're, we're trying to elevate here, what are your thoughts on how to measure that impact as a region? Well, I think this region really lends itself to that because we, um, we know with the attitude that people have to their business here, quite a bit of the input that goes into um, what these businesses need, and ideally we get a better understanding of the outputs. Um, I don't think at, at Cawthon we are yet in a position to actually measure this, but um, I think within um, due course we will have the capability through AI and all the data that is being collected ready to actually get a bigger understanding of a community um, impact on the environment. And, that is something that is really important to achieve well, ideally as soon as possible to understand where to next. Mm. So we've got businesses for climate action, the Te Tauhu Intergenerational Strategy, yeah. AI Institute and Cawthorn. Have we got a project <coughs> as a region? Yeah, potentially we, we do have a project. I mm. think that uh, the difficult thing about Nelson, you know, and the region is that was traditionally the five Fs, I think, which were running the region and, and now there's a different theme emerging perhaps mm. <clears throat> so it's possibly quite difficult for small businesses uh, um, even till really recently to uh, converge around a theme you know what is it that Nelson is about so that's that's one of the important things which which can lead us perhaps in, into you know the new future and and help new businesses to you know to market themselves if, if we do as a region if we decide and if we collaborate with our next door regions and decide on a really successful theme what can we how can we market ourselves mm. that would be it right mm. and I, I'm personally excited by that opportunity I always think about uh, you know all of you here tr travel away for for work at different times and and you know we're being from from Nelson, from Te who the first response you get is around the lifestyle. Oh, this place is so lovely, it's sunny, it has amazing beaches, it has the national parks. And I always think, what's the opportunity for us? To, when's the point where we go away and people say, wow, you're from Te Tauihu, those businesses there really care. That, that region is doing some incredible things in, in the space of climate change and environmental regeneration. Um, Mariana, you've got some thoughts on this, and also back to the data question as well around, around how we actually measure that impact. And then uh, over to you as well, Florence, from a Businesses for Climate Change perspective, just to wrap that part up. Yeah, well, um, you know, through the, the regional strategy, we came up with the wellbeing and the equity monitor. So, again, that came about because through the engagement with communities in terms of those priorities. What I would say that was interesting um, around those measures and then where the data is, because they're in a plethora of places, um, whether it be at central government or at regional, or it's, if it's taken, it's taken sporadically. So we do have some challenges around data. 
Um, there's always, always also the question too is who is going to be the custodian of that data? Um, and so when you think about data sovereignty and you think about internationally what's happening with data and how that's been used, you know, we have to be able to have an infrastructure here in the region that supports um, our responsibilities as, as the custodians uh, of that. So I think going through that process of being able to measure you know, you know, the priorities and then the impacts and then be able to say over time, are we making the change that we need to? And then also being able to... Um, you know, say what is investment is required, and I'll go back to my point around the advocacy and lobbying for the investment to come out of central government to support us. You know, it is all sort of tied in together. So I feel that through the strategy work, we've got a really good foundation. It's just how do we take it then to the next level? How do we share? Uh, how can people access that data? How do they benefit? And then how, how can we share it? And we can do it through the different technologies. Mm -hmm. Sorry? Yeah, I think data is so important and I think we need to get a lot better at measuring in this region. I think one of the best parts about Businesses for Climate Action has been seeing these industry groups working together on smaller projects that can be measured and it's not um, a region as a whole, but for example, in Businesses for Climate Action we have sectors working together on carbon hotspots and then like emission types also working together. So in the sectors we've got fleet management, tourism, food and beverage, and recently you know, all the tourism members of Businesses for Climate Action got together and created a zero carbon tourist destination for this region. And then that was marketed to Aotearoa and it was, um, yeah, NRDA came on board and the exact measurement of that is so easy and that short uh, story can be shared. So I think that having more projects like that, um, even though it's not measurement of the of the whole region is such an important way to be able to share stories. Mm. I think the m main step is really to get started yeah. because you <laughs> yeah. immediately tend to think this is all far <coughs> too difficult. Yeah. Um, but to, to get started, utilize the good examples that are out there and build on that, and ideally by appointing a person that's responsible to lead the project and, and move on. So a related question to that then from, from Jennifer Rutherford saying, how can we help um, from the local community to progress initiatives and put more weight behind the progress uh, rather than all starting from scratch? So how do, how do we, there's been a lot of discussion tonight about joint up thinking. So w what steps do we need to there to get away from that fragmentation, that siloed mentality? Any thoughts on that? There are good examples worldwide. Actually, a city like Amsterdam mm -hmm. or Melbourne that have come together to create this whole circular economy thinking and have started with little projects and brought them together to really create along the lines of the donut economy a, a system that regenerates etc but it all started somewhere with someone just taking the lead and that is that would be my proposal so I, I, just I, do it, hmm? yeah, just just do do it. it. Yeah. exactly yeah. Just do it. so I'm, I'm <coughs> not much too much in, in, in the system here yet to understand who would exactly be, whether that would be businesses for climate action, whether that would be someone appointed by council or so, but it really often comes down to a single responsibility that goes off and takes the lead. I've got a, I have a related question here. So we, we've talked about just doing it and just getting on with it, and there are some very obvious changes and steps in front of us, but I guess, I guess one area that's interesting and um, relating back to, I guess, our primary sector, our agriculture, food and fibre sector, and thinking about, we've known for some time about the impacts uh, of some of our practices right across businesses, and there's questions <coughs> in here about tourism and, and other businesses, other sectors as well. Um, so, Te Poho's put in here, and it's been, uh, been upvoted, you know, Te Taui, whose land and sea will continue to fuel our prosperity into the future. Uh, how do we change our relationship with Te Taio from extractive to reciprocal? And within that aspiration, which I don't think anyone will, will disagree with, I guess, how, how do you actually make that transition? Because we know the changes that are needed, we understand the urgency of them, um, but there's a real sense that we're, I think you said, Mark, you know, globally complicit in, in some of these challenges. So then what is the gap then? Because it's clearly <coughs> just getting on with it as part of it, but what do we actually need to do to enable that change? Yeah, well, <clears throat> certainly when I first came to New Zealand, the tyr tyranny of distance was really mm. obvious, and the fact that uh, you know New Zealand is so far away from those uh, educated, discerning, differentiated premium markets around the world, and and 
then there's a certain amount of ignorance about what they really want, yeah. what they really need, and therefore then the standards here have to raise up. You can't just be complacent and think, oh, it's from New Zealand, it's clean and green, it's great. Because yeah. actually, if you look deeply, it's not. There is bottom trawling, you know. Those fish, mm, they're slightly, you know, people are going vegan all the time because they don't like it. So uh, <clears throat> it is about standing up and... Uh, and actually, uh, Mariana said, honest conversations, you know, they're hard in a small community. Uh, I think um, what we'll see coming out, um, hopefully um, soon, is the opportunity for us to, um, and I always say about the coalition of the willing, because we don't need a cast of thousands. But we do need those, um, you know, back to the um, food and fibre sector, we do need those businesses that are prepared to have a good look at themselves yeah. and then prepared to you know, come on a journey. That might not happen overnight, but at least you get that coalition of the willing that can actually start, as an example, mm -hmm. to be able to lead the way. Because to create way. movement and to create change, you often just need those little, you know, those groups that can be the, the catalyst. And then it's showing some level of vulnerability, which we're not probably always yeah. good at doing um, as, as New Zealanders. But I think it's, it is like they're being honest about where we're at, but, but also, you know, where, where the potential is. So I'm hoping that we will get that coalition of the willing here in the region that may want to sign up to a new way of doing things on their land with their water in terms of climate, uh, as well as our um, living communities and being part of the, the design for that. And then, of course, that comes, then you push out on farm into the catchment across the value chain and then in market. So I'm, I'm just hoping that um, when the new programs are released, that we can actually have those businesses here that will sign up. And then let's just go for it. And like I said, we may not have all the answers, but it's time to um, try things differently. And I think a lot of us will be surprised yeah. in terms of what we're actually doing. But again, it's that whole reset of the research and um, the science um, community um, in terms of what's happening there. And it is about actually locally coming together as businesses to participate. Mm. So then taking that down a level then, so we're talking about the, uh, the transitions required. Uh, Kathy Golds here has put a question saying, if a full turnaround is 180 degrees, what is a one degree change or new behaviour you would like from me and others in the room to commit to right now? <clears throat> Any thoughts? Very, on a very practical basis. Um, think transport, utilize more public transport, cycle, um, start with these little things. They already make a big difference. I was impressed that the topic of plastic bags is often laughed at, but how quickly that actually changed the mindset of people um, in, in New Zealand from one day to another almost, because large companies decided we are, we are going a long way, but that started with consumers pushing um, for that, um, that change. I think um, when I look at Nelson, not that many hills. We should all be able to cycle. Mm. <laughs> I do. <laughs> <laughs> Any other thoughts on that? Um, I think I might have heard from the crowd, and it might have been my cousin, actually. I think he might have yelled out, close the landfills. Um, and, you know, we often heard, you know, around there, around <laughs> constraints. Uh, and interesting, this came up in Marlborough, actually, it was the yeah. fact, you know, could we close the landfills within 10 years? What sort of behaviour change would we get? So it is about having those types of goals. And then as individual citizens, um, you know, what is our responsibility to enable that? And my cousin might also say the fact that we should have civics in our schools. Yes. <laughs> um, because, you know, to be a good citizen, to be a good ancestor, um, sometimes, you know, that teaching um, needs to happen somewhere. So... Um, yeah, I, I think you know, I'll probably agree with my cousin. He, I hope he likes that. Um, yeah, close the landfills. <laughs> and talking about landfills, just imagine every single takeaway in this region used the same plastic bowls that were then recyclable, and you could use them in any of those mm -hmm. takeaways if you brought them back and refilled them again. Oh. Today we throw them all away. They're all of a different grade. Mm. It's just these little things. Florence, one degree from you? Oh, That's I've it. got, there's too many degrees um, to talk about, but um, lots of things. I think we should be listening to our children. There was, you know, hundreds of thousands of children around the world last year out on the street 
talking about climate and some changes have been made from that but this is something that the next generation wants and those are our consumers, they're our future um, employers, employees, business owners and that change is coming <coughs> and everyone else can either be leaders or laggers so why don't we listen to children and um, start working in that direction. And I think also um, just using your consumer power, you know, every dollar that you spend, that's going into someone's pocket and think about whose pocket is going into and whether or not you want to be supporting that person. Mm. Yeah, Mark, one degree from you. Yeah, look, I think everyone's, everyone's said the one degree. I, I, I don't think... I, I, I'm a 100% guy. Mm. I'm, not an, I'm not a one degree guy. <laughs> <laughs> we've, about your 100%. we've just had a really interesting question and this is uh, the last question I'll put to you before we ask for some from wrap up thoughts for the evening this one's from Emily uh, it's how can I be a part of this I would love to work with such inspiring speakers and inspiring businesses that we've heard from tonight and I, and I guess I'll add to that to say that um, Intelligent Guardians in this event is the continuation of a path that I think the region is already on. It's a path that's well yeah. mandated through the Te Tauihu Intergenerational Strategy. You know, we had over a thousand people turn up in rooms during the Te Tauihu Strategy, all speaking very clearly with one voice about the type of direction the region would like to see. And, and Intelligent Guardians is just one manifestation of that. Businesses for Climate Action is another, and a whole other raft of other initiatives. That's the type of strategic and enduring transformational change that Mariana was talking about in her talk. It's, it eventually becomes sweet. It seems small and, and discreet in moments, but it becomes sweeping and creates that change. And so uh, this is just the start of, of a new chapter and a new conversation, but I think this question is really interesting because it relates to your businesses and it's really testament to the fact that when you come together under a banner like this, like Intelligent Guardians, you are now all grouped under that banner, Intelligent Guardians. You've got someone saying, how do I come and work for these inspiring businesses? That's really what this concept's all about. And so if you've anyone got anything to add to that? The immediate thought that comes to mind is um, collaboration, but in a different sense here, that we ideally have a pool that people can enter into as a, as a resource to be utilized by any of those collaborators um, that actually target certain outcomes here, that have bought into a vision um, that all brings us forward in, in finding solutions, that you actually apply for a position in that pool, and then that's directed to a business that has that has a position that is relevant. It's a great idea. Yeah. Well, I think we're just the tip of the iceberg here, aren't we, really? Mm -hmm. It's not about uh, working for us. Uh, uh, I mean, we're looking for people with PhDs in AI, and they're like hen's teeth, I can tell you. Um, so it's pretty hard to work for us. But uh, there are hundreds, maybe thousands of companies in, in the region who mm. are going to tip in. Mm. So... I don't think it's going to be that hard to take part. I think it's all about reaching out to people that you connect with and there's thousands of intelligent guardians and yeah. whakatū and it might be community compost or it might be businesses for climate action or the Cawthron, but reach out to people that resonate with you and that you connect with and don't be scared. I think that's a cool thing about living in Nelson yeah. as well is you can just send any of us, anyone in this room, an email and chances are we'll take you out for coffee. You know, it's, um, it's just two degrees of separation. Yeah. So reach out to people that you want to connect with and you'll be really surprised, I think, at what you get back. Mm. Yeah, I, um, yes, and, and I'll probably just to add, the next stage of work for the uh, Te Tauhu, uh, re, um Intergenerational Regional Strategy was actually forming a community engagement platform. So that was the way that people could actually share their initiatives. Because we, we don't have any platform or um, way to find out what people are doing. So that, for us, was a really good strategic opportunity to be able to put that together so people could share what they're up to if they had different skill sets. You know, it's almost like you become the, the new sort of, um, you know, the pages or the yellow pages, <laughs> um, you know, in the region. Um, and, you know, going through that particular work, you know, we found, and I think it was something, I don't know, a thousand NGOs or some phenomenal amount and just in Nelson Tasman alone. And when you meet with them, they're tired they say, you only ring us up if there's an earthquake or something, and, you know, or they're in doing bloody funding applications. So, you know, th there was this plethora of good people, and obviously a lot of them were volunteers, but again, you know, mobilising them in a space and to do a reset, even just of our NGO um, sector, is, is really quite important. So the community platform, um, the wellbeing um, framework, 
and then just being able to coordinate these initiatives mm. in a more structured and disciplined manner mm. was really important. But to and, and that's it often gets in that sort of intangible space because it's not um, sort of seen as you know. Um, I don't know, potentially a good investment. And so that's what we've been really struggling with as to who gets behind the next stage of the strategy work mm -hmm. to be able to um, push that forward because we're there. And I'm so pleased that we did the work prior to COVID because that's now brought us through to where we need to get to. But to push on to that next stage, to be able to do that community platform and all of those other things, it needs to be resourced and it needs to be um, led out not just by um, some of us, but actually all of us. Mm. That brings us to the conclusion of the conversation this evening. Uh, I'm going to give each of our panellists an opportunity to share their, their closing thoughts and reflections. Um, but before I do that, I'd like to thank you all for your, for your contribution and everyone here for your participation this evening. Uh, I th as I said, you know, this marks an important next step down a path that we are already on. Um, but I really want to thank you for your insights, your wisdom, uh, your passion for this place and for making positive changes here. I really appreciate the time you've all put into your presentations this evening uh, and the whakaaro you shared so, so generously and passionately with us all. Um, so I'd like to start with Volker now for your uh, closing thoughts and, and wrap up for, for this evening. Thank you, Johnny, and thank you all for, for having me here tonight. Um, I feel a lot of good intention in, in this region, and my question is, how do we bring this all together um, and follow a compelling vision that we all have somewhere inside us? With Escothron, we are certainly able to help to a very large degree on um, the challenges that we face out there, but who is it that I talk to? Who is it that I embark on in order to bring this all together? There is, that's a parting question that I have. Um, but I must say, having lived in many different countries out there and having um, had many discussions around similar topics, um, this is probably the area that can lead by example, because there is such a good spirit around um, to make this happen. So um, I wish us all good luck on embarking on the future, hoping that my little daughter at my age will experience an environment that is not as challenging as it is today, but actually has an outlook that is positive. Uh, thanks, Johnny. Well, look, I'm all here. I'm all about sustainability, really. And uh, I, I'm glad that that is uh, the mainstream conversation these days. Uh, so it's, uh, it's really uh, rewarding to, uh, you know, be, be part of that and think that, uh, you know, whereas once I was the weird guy... Uh, now that's that's the main You're the cool guy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. And um, look, hopefully, technology can can be part of that and can help help that along the way. And uh, with any luck, this region can can be a leader. Manila. Well, uh, you know, if there was any time um, in history that we can um, make a change, uh, it's now. Mm. So I guess that's the, the, the call to action, is the fact that, you know, if we can uh, rally together, um, yeah, I, I think that, that's, that's, that's the opportunity. And I'm, I'm actually um, quite hopeful that we can um, do that. And I liken it back to, um, again, when our ancestors stood on, on that beach and they were hopeful and they really wanted, you know, believed in genuine partnership. And I fundamentally believe that we can lead it out from this region because what's good for us is good for country and it's also good for the world. Yeah. My mind is just buzzing from all the different connections here from the conversations um, out in the foyer, the questions from the audience and listening um, to the four of you. I think there is so, so much to offer in this region and it's about connecting all the dots and if we can share all our knowledge together and share all our data, I think that we can come up with solutions together to be good ancestors. Kia ora. And I'd really like to acknowledge as, as part of that conversation as well um, NRDA and all of this. Um, it's thanks to NRDA that we, uh, this Intelligent Guardians concept uh, has come to life this evening and it's, it's just the beginning of a, of a new phase of work and a new chapter around economic development in the region. But it really is exciting times for NRDA and the wider region. 
uh, we're, most of you will be aware, and uh, she's in the audience with us here tonight, that we've been joined by a new Chief Executive at NRDA, Fiona Wilson. Uh, so to Fiona, no mai haere mai ki te uh, We're so pleased and thrilled to have you here in the region. Uh, we've been very excited getting to know you over the past couple of weeks, and uh, I hope tonight was a great first event uh, for you, Fiona, and for uh, the rest of the NRDA team here, who through the last 12 months have put in an extraordinary effort delivering all their business as usual and stepping up and doing so much work on top of that to help us recover from COVID-19. Uh, so I'd just like to acknowledge you now, Dave, with a round of applause, please. Thank you. And I guess finally to, to the NRDA team who have worked on this event and our production crew uh, who pulled everything together behind the scenes. Putting something like tonight on is no mean feat and I'm sure you'll all appreciate the, the standard of production uh, that's been achieved tonight through uh, a very talented local agency, Wolf Horse, and in collaboration with the NRDA team. So I do want to acknowledge two people in particular. One is Hannah Norton from the NRDA who is leading this work around Intelligent Guardians uh, and has been the master to mind behind the event and pulling everyone together this evening, uh, and also Dylan Galletley, who's the uh, production manager slash creative genius behind everything you see uh, before you tonight as well. Uh, and between Hannah and Dylan, they've led teams, to, uh, big teams tonight really, to pull this together and make it possible. So a round of applause for everyone who's worked on the event. And with that, I look forward to carrying on the conversation with you all. Thank you to everyone who's joined us uh, as part of Tech Week, uh, all our whanaunga from around the country who have broadcast in to join us uh, here in Nelson, Tasman tonight. It's been an honour being able to share just some of the stories that we have here in the region uh, with, we all, with you all. So we thank you for your engagement and participation and, and sharing in this story with us as we help develop and grow um, this new chapter. Uh, but for tonight, that's all from us. So, Pomari e tato, ngā mihi nui ki a koutou katoa. Kia ora. Kia ora. Kia ora.